Hello, everybody. I welcome you to the quality control session. And this is split into uh, the theoretical part and the practical part. Here, I will cover um, briefly the intention behind quality control for next generation sequencing experiments and then go deeper into how to do quality control. There, we use mainly uh, a tool called FastQC. And in order to, um, for you to understand this session, you need to have listened to the introductory courses for Galaxy. So you need to kind of know how to operate in Galaxy. And I will answer these three main questions. So how to control quality of next generation sequencing data. What are, so what are the main quality parameters to check? And um, I also sometimes briefly explain if you see there's a quality breach, then how can I improve my data? And the main objectives you get from the session is are, are that you can manipulate FASTQ files that you can control. Uh, so you can, you can do a quality, quality control with FASTQ files and that you can use the tool FASTQC, understand what the output is of FASTQC, and then um, act accordingly if you see there are some quality breaches and then maybe do some quality corrections. So why you have to do quality control? I mean, it's um, obvious why you would do a quality control because you want to check if your experiment worked or not, right? So you want to check um, you have a lot of steps for next generation sequencing data. So the experiment, the library preparations, the sequencing, and even some additional steps in between. Um, and you want to check, for example, did my knockout work uh, worked correctly? Did the sequencing actually, um, I mean, if you send it to a sequencing facility, it's always worth to check if, if the sequencing facility um, did something incorrect, something might happen there, or even for your library preparation, right? So there could be um, some contamination happened um, and you want to check uh, if your library is really, if there was a, a quality breach. And there are many, many next generation sequencing experiments, ChIP-seq, ClipSeq, RNA-seq, HiC, and so on. They all generate their own, so they all have their own protocols, their own biases, which you have to look after. And even, for example, for ClipSeq, so in the investigation also of the proteome and the transcriptome, where you link the uh, protein to RNA with cross-linking, even there you have different protocols like iClip, eClip, ParClip, HITS, and so on. And all of these protocols, I can tell you, they have even different biases, which you have to check. However, every next generation sequencing data follows kind of this, these last steps. They are um, so sequenced, of course, with Illumina, Anotorrent, or Nanoprompt. And what you get out of it is either a raw pasta file, but more importantly, you need a fast Q file. Um, for Nanopore, for example, you get a FASTA, also sometimes we just call it a FASTA5 file, but even the FASTA5 file isn't, um, or you try to convert it into fast Q file. And this fast Q file you then use for quality control. And after you've done the quality control, after you checked, if my raw data um, has some quality breaches, you go um, in, in, in other steps like mapping and your general data analysis. So now let's talk about the main format. So I mentioned the, uh, you have faster format and you have a fast queue format. So what, what's faster? If you never heard about it, a faster file is mainly list, uh, or it lists mainly all of your reads, which, which you sequenced. And it always follows this format that you have one line for, for your read, which uh, is your read identifier. Sometimes after the read identifier, you have some comments like um, the organism which was sequenced. 
And then the second line is the actual sequence. So A, T, C, or G, we sim uh, symbolize it here with axis. You sometimes have um, ends in there. Um, what an N stands for, I will explain later on. And uh, then after the second line follows the second read. So a second read identifier, a second, so the sequence for this read, and this goes on and on. So then follows the third, fourth, and so on. Yeah. And so this is the basic FASTA file. And then you have uh, the fast Q format, which so the Q stands for quality. And again, you have two lines, the read, uh, one line for the read identifier with some comments and then the second line for the sequence. Then you have an additional third line. You very, very often see a plus sign here. So this is kind of a filler line if you want to include again, some additional information. And then you have a fourth line where you have the quality string. We symbolize it here with Qs, but of course there are different characters. And each uh, Q here, so to say, so each character stands for the quality that this base or this base call was wrong or not. So the accuracy of this base call from the sequencing device. Um, after the fourth line follows again the uh, this, uh, second read, so a second read identifier, the sequence, the additional filler line, and then the quality string, and then again the third uh, third read, fourth read, and so on. So what is this quality string, or what are these quality scores? They are called FRED quality scores or FRED scores. And they, again, give you an idea about the accuracy of the, the base call. Let's say you have a FRED quality score of 10. This means that um, your base call was 90% accurate, meaning um, in, to, to, 10, to a chance or probability of 10%, this base call was wrong or not. So let's say if you have, 10 reads, so 10 times the same read, then one of these reads, um, this base is wrong. Obviously, if the FRED score uh, increases, so let's say you have a FRED score of 20, then you have a base score accuracy of 99%, meaning there's only a chance of 1% that the base score was wrong, so that this particular base, so this A, T, G, or C is wrong or not. How is this FRED score actually calculated? So there's a conversion. So this probability of your base score being wrong. So let's say 1%, 0.1, um, you calculate or you convert it into a FRED score by taking the logarithm and then uh, multiply it by minus 10. So let's say 1%, 0.1, the logarithm is then minus one times minus 10 is 10. So you have a FRED score of 10. Um, and uh, here also in this picture, it's very important. So you have to make sure which kind of sequencing device you use. So this calculation is different for the technologies. So let's say for Solexa, it's kind of a, a bit different conversion. And so you always have to check which kind of sequencing device you have used. And um, I always uh, also mentioned that at the end, what, what you have in the FASTQ file is a quality string. So not numbers, because obviously if you have um, numbers and it's either a very long, long line or it's very hard to, to, to know them because you have a very, very big number to know what kind of quality scores you have or not. So at some point it was decided that the FRED score is converted to a character by using the ASCII code. So what you have in your computer, all of these characters, so what you have on your keyboard, um, if you type it in, actually this is, um, normally represented in the machine, so in the computer as a number. 
um, you can see. So in ASCII code, the add sign um, the is, has the number 64. And now we can use this to convert uh, the number of the FRED score into, the cap into a character, so to say. And again, it's very important here that you know what kind of sequencing machine, so to, which, which kind of sequencing machine was used. Because if you ever want to investigate um, these base calls yourself, or these quality strings, then based on the sequencing device, um, there's a different default where these um, FRED score starts. So, for example, here already also with, 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 uh, with different versions of the sequencing devices, it can change. So for example, here in Illumina 1.3, they started with a FRED score of zero at this add sign. And then if you have a FRED score of 40, you would end up with an H. Whereas in Illumina uh, 1.8 and higher, they changed that. Uh, the default is here. The, the, the FRED score of zero is at the exclamation mark. And if you have a FRED score of 40 or 41, then you're here at uh, J or K. So you always have to check for your sequencing device. OK, so now we go a bit deeper into identifying potential quality issues. And for that, we concentrate on yeah, the very important tool called FastQC. So if you try to search for it in Galaxy, you will find it very quickly. And you apply it to a fast queue or a set of fast queue files. You can also apply it to some BAM files. And then you get as a result an HTML um, report. So if you open it, you greet it with the first um, page, so to say, where you see the basic statistics. It lists you some general information about your read library, like the file name, the file type, the encoding. So there you can also check again which kind of sequencing device and version you have used or was used. Then the total number of sequences in your read library. So you have here a thousand reads. Um, this, uh, the sequences which are flagged by first QC as pure quality. And so here's zero. Then you see the general sequencing length. So all of the reads in this read library have a length of 100 nucleotides. And you see the um, average or the general GC content, so the fraction of, of, of GC content. And it's here. So almost all reads have like 50% 50, 50 have, uh, or GC content of 50%. And if you then go to the first plot, um, this is one of the most important ones where you, you see the per base quality score. So on the X axis, you see the position in the read, so the base pair or the base. And for each position, you get the a distribution for the quality, so the FRED quality score, uh, which is plotted as a box plot, as you can see here. And the blue line is the mean quality score for all of the positions. And the red zone is basically a very poor quality, a green zone, which begins at around 20 to 28 is okayish quality and 28 to 40 is then a very good or good quality. So the green zone. And so a FRED score of 20, as you maybe remember, is around about uh, like uh, accuracy of 99%. So 1% that the base is wrong or not. A probability of 1%. Here you can see uh, this is an experiment where you see already um, uh, good quality. And in this example, you see an experiment with a very bad, or not a very bad, but a, a bad quality. And uh, you see the, the end of the reads in the read library, um, you have very poor quality. So it's in this red area. You will also get an information, immediately an information and a report about this. And now you have two decisions or you can make several decisions now. So you either can get rid of the data set at all if you have another, a lot of other quality breaches as well. But you can also decide to actually trim off the ends. Um, this is actually quite common. 
So you do this quite often um, because in, uh, with every sequencing technology, even with, with this nanopore, the base quality at the end of the reads is always a bit worse than in the beginning. And the longer the read, the worse it gets. And quite often you then do something called an end trimming. So you cut off the ends if there is some quality issues. And this you can do with Trimomatic or cut adapt. Uh, for example, here in this intermediate quality example, where you can see that you have only here three positions at the end, which are poor quality, you would probably do um, an end trimming and um, leave, of course, leave the whole data set. After this per base quality, you have this per sequence quality, where you see on the x-axis the FRET score uh, or the distribution of the FRET scores. And on the y-axis, the number of reads with this average FRET score. And so it's basically a distribution of the average FRET score in your read library. And you hope to see a very high peak in a, in a, in a, at least with, with a FRET score of 20 or 20 plus. Um, if you see a little bump here, with some reads with lower average quality, then you can either again decide to get rid of them. So this you can do either again with cut adapt has, has I think some options to get rid of low quality reads in general and also um, mappers, some mappers already do this internally like Bowtie. Uh, of course, if you do an end trimming, this can also change so if you do with cut adapt and end trimming, then um, the average quality for this read increases. And this can already improve your overall quality for your read library. Then you have um, this plot here, which is specific for Illumina sequencing. If you're familiar, familiar with Illumina sequencing, you have a flow cell with different lanes. And you have a flow cell with two lanes. And here on the, on the y-axis, you see this. And on the x-axis is the position in the read. Because it's a sequence by synthesis, it's kind of um, a plot showing you how the sequence performed over time. So the longer, so the, the uh, higher the position or the later the position, so to say, <laughs> the later the time. And um, it's a uh, called by what scaling here, meaning that um, cold, the cold color, so blue color stands for good quality, uh, hot color, so red stands for poor quality. Ideally, this picture should be completely blue, but you can see there are some bars, some positions here in both lanes, which are red. Doesn't have, doesn't have to mean now that this was a very poor uh, experiment or sequencing. Maybe these two positions have been, or these positions have been a poor quality. I would actually keep this experiment. However, if you see a very big stretch or a lot of positions with red, then this is um, um, an indication that the sequencing went, went wrong. So. What might have happened is then quite often there's an, there was an air bubble in the flow cell and then the sequencing didn't work out um, well enough and you would probably then get rid of this data set. And if we come back to this plot, which is the per base sequence content showing you on the x-axis the position in the read and on the y-axis the fraction of the reads which have this nucleotide. So the fraction for the T, for T, G, uh, C, A, and G. Um, ideally, um, of course, there shouldn't be any bias. Uh, so the fraction for all of the nucleotides should be um, similar through the whole read library. This is, of course, not the case. Um, you see it actually quite often in the beginning or at the end, at the end, because the uh, quality is sometimes a bit worse in the beginning. Uh, could also be because of adapters and also at the end because of adapters. 
Um, however, there are also protocols like ClipSec or ChipSec even like cut and run. They have internal biases because of the restriction enzymes they use, or sometimes even if you, uh, yeah, or because of the restriction enzymes you have used, and then you see um, generally some biases in there. And this does not mean this is poor quality, it's just a bias of the protocol. So you have to kind of, so this is um, where I have to say you really have to, again, know what your protocol is doing and what kind of biases your protocol is inducing to your data. So it doesn't, if you do, for example, a Clipsic experiment, and I see something like this, doesn't mean immediately this is a bad quality. It just confirms the bias the, the, the protocol and uses. However, if you know and you anticipate no bias uh, or no different nucleotide composition in your data, then this is either a quality breach because of uh, poor fragmentation or your fragmentation didn't work so well because you have done a very aggressive adapter trimming. I come to that in a moment, what this means, uh, meaning that you remove the adapters quite heavily and ending up with a bias because of this um, uh, yeah, step or because of over represented sequences. So there's maybe contamination or some repetitive um, RNA in there or some, some RNAs from, from repetitive regions, um, then this can show you, uh, or this could be the case for, for, for this nucleotide bias. The other plot here, the per sequence GC content shows you what you also get from the initial statistic, shows you the, here on the x-axis, the mean GC content, so the, the, the uh, fraction for it, or the percent. And on the y-axis, the number of reads with this GC content. And blue is always the theoret theoretical distribution, which should be normal distributed. And in red, you see the actual emp uh, empirical distribution of your data. So there can be, it's again a plot where you kind of have to know a bit more about your experiment, your organism, and the protocol you have used. Because you can end up here um, also with a bimodal distribution. So meaning you have a second bump or more than one bump in here. If you do a metagenome analysis, of course, if you have different organ, if you analyze a sample with different organisms, they have different GC contents and therefore end up with a distribution um, showing more than one uh, peak. However, if you don't anticipate something like this, it should, should be unimodal, so only one normal distribution, one P, then this maybe means that you see a bimodal distribution that you have a contamination in your data. The contamination in the data um, probably is also shown if the, the distribution is very broad. And um, another thing, if the distribution is very spiky, so there's a very spiky peak, um, then this could in, uh, imply that you have a very heavy adapter contamination in there, uh, which has a specific GC content, of course, and then you have this big spike in there. So look out for um, this GC content, so this, indicates a bit more about contaminations, yeah, about uh, library contaminations. Then you have this per base end content. Maybe you remember I mentioned when I talked about the fast and fast Q file format that you have your sequence string. So where you have A, T, G, and C. However, there might be another character, an N in there. And this is due to the case that the sequencing machine, of course, does your base calling. So it decides at which position, which base you have, and gives you then also this quality score, so this thread score for it. However, if the algorithm, because the signal was not strong enough, or it couldn't really detect what this base is, and it gets really, really low, 
then it cannot decide with uh, with high con or with some confidence anymore that this is an ATG or C, and therefore it sets uh, a placeholder, and this placeholder character is an M. So showing you the sequencing machine couldn't anymore detect what kind of base at this position is correct or not, or is yeah if this is an ATG or C. Of course, here on the x-axis, you see the position in the read. On the y-axis, how many or the fraction of the reads in your read library having an N at that position. And of course, ideally, you hope to see nothing. So everything should be at zero. If you see something like this here, so this is very poor quality, then hope maybe you can get rid of it by, again, end trimming. So getting rid of these bases at the end or at the beginning. However, if you see a lot of them here, so like this, there's also in the middle some, a lot of reads which has ends here. So there's really then this, you would then combine all of the plots which we already discussed and see if there maybe happened something with the sequencing device or if there was a problem with contamination, um, then you would probably uh, maybe get rid of the data set entirely. Then you have the sequence length distribution, just showing you yeah, the length of your sequences in your read library here on the x-axis, on the y-axis, the number of reads. Um, so this here means that all of the reads um, have a length of 75 uh, bases. Um, this doesn't have to be. So if you already anticipate that there is a variation as the sequences because of fragmentation or because of um, your experimental design, then at least you hope to see a very high or big spike at um, a specific length. You, um, how you designed, uh, at which you know how you designed your uh, read library, and then it drops immediately. Um, also, when you do an, the uh, end trimming or adapter trimming and you investigate again the quality of the reads to check these steps, and of course also these reads have then different uh, length and you would also see a non-constant distribution. Yeah, so this is a general check up if, um, yeah, where you can check if your design of your uh, read library was correct or not. And then we come back to this plot, uh, duplicated, the duplication level plot, showing you on the x-axis the sequences, sequence duplication level. As you know, or maybe know, that because of PCR, you will end up with sequence duplicates. So uh, reads or sequences which are simply duplicated because of the PCR and the sequencing technology. Uh, this happens and um, hope, ideally would see actually no duplicates. So duplication level of one, but quite often you see at least two, uh, a bit of a bit spike here in, in two, which you can see here. So the blue line is your actual uh, distribution and the red line is the distribution if you would do deduplications um, here on the y-axis. So this is yeah, on the y-axis is the fraction of reads with this duplication level. And how fast QC is doing this is it just checks this the, the sequence so in the read library if it can find the same sequence once, twice, three tries, and so on. Um, again, doesn't mean that this experiment was um, bad or not. If you see uh, spikes in higher in higher duplication levels, like maybe nine, ten, or even higher. It just so for for example in uh, chipsec or clipsec, I anticipate to see something like this. Um, in RNA sec, also probably. However, if you see it, really a very big spike in in higher levels, and this is an indication that you have done too many PCR cycles. 
And uh, yeah, you probably have to then redo the experiment. Um, if not, so small bumps in here or maybe a bit more bumps in, in higher levels, it's not that big of a deal. You only have to then consider if you do a deduplication or not a deduplication. So remove some of these non-unique uh, molecules. This is where I would say you have to, to de decide based on the experiment again and if you have enough material. For example, in ChIPSEC, I see that again often that there is a bit of some duplicate, duplicated reads in there. And I see that I only have 2 million reads, depending on the world, let's say on human, 2 million reads. Then probably I wouldn't do a deduplication if I have to do the differential expression analysis because I reduce the data too much to, or I remove too much of important information because also in ChIPSEC, um, Maybe these reads come from different transcript isoforms. So I actually remove some important information. And I have not enough data. So for ChIPSEC, if you don't want to do differential expression analysis, it's at least you need to have around about 10 million reads, which is, which is a good number to do a differential expression analysis. In ClipSEC, however, um, you there quite often do a deduplication because you um, it's very important to know um, we have your protein is binding you to your transcriptome and the reads are generally quite short and therefore it's um, you have a high duplication level and you need to do a deduplication. This one here, this plot shows adapter contamination. So first QC also checks for standard um, adapters from no, for, for well-known devices, Lumina, Nextera, and so on. So these kind of adapters, it checks if, if it can find these sequences in your data. Uh, hopefully, um, so if you already removed your adapters, it will not find anything, of course. If you, if you really have the raw data, then you, you will see that there is something in your data. And, and so, if you have a, have a quality breach there, you do uh, an adapter trimming with cut adapt or trim galore. There are a lot of tools which, which will help you with that. And um, I have to point out, if you do an adapter trimming, really check this again. Don't assume that I applied now my tool to my data, then the adapter is gone. No, please check this. It's also sometimes really important to check this because you there are sometimes read library which is a bit more complex. You have maybe an adapter um, uh, at the beginning and at the end, and sometimes a double ligation of an adapter. And so you have to do a double adapter trimming and so really check this if this is gone. So on the x-axis is the position of the read, on the y-axis the, the fraction um, of the reads having this adapter sequence. And again, if you see in uh, a quality breach in here, so uh, as soon as there is a fraction uh, or some fraction higher than uh, two or, or, or three percent, it will show you a warning that there are probably some adapter sequences in your data, and then you have to do have to do an adapter trimming. This goes more or less hand in hand, hand with this plot. It's the KMER content plot showing you. Um, the position here on the x-axis in the read, on the y-axis the uh, fraction of your reads with this came at this position. Um, I said hand in hand because if you have adapters in there, then you um, quite often see also something in the came content. Of course, you have a, a molecule or a sequence which occurs. Uh, more than once in your read library, and therefore you have an increase in some k um, also then shown here. If you removed some adapters and you still see some k content, doesn't have to be that, again, that this is a poor quality. Maybe it just means it happens quite often for an, an, an ASIC experiment. So um, if you have, have uh, repetitive or satellite 
uh, sequences in there, then of course you see something in the KMO content. Okay, um, with that, we are more or less at the end. So I already um, talked at every plot a bit um, what you can do, what you can to, to uh, improve the quality. I told you that um, so filtering of sequences, if you see uh, that you have uh, this average or mean quality score um, distribution, if this is a, if, if you have there a quality breach, you can filter for low quality sequences. Some map bars include this already internally, but you can also do it with CutAdapt or some other tools. If the reads are too short, um, so you see that your read lengths are too short, so lower than 30. Maybe also worth to filter out, depending on your experiment with a tool. Also, you can use cut adapter or trimomatic. Uh, with too many end bases, you can do an end trimming or um, again filter out these sequences. Um, GC content wise, if you see a GC content bias in there, uh, which you don't assume or which you ha have not anticipated, there is a tool also to correct for this. Um, it's called, uh, if you search for deep tool GC content correction in Galaxy, there's a tool um, which you can use to correct for a GC content bias. But only use it if you are sure um, the GC content um, or there's a bias should not be in your data. There are other quality um, measure or um, tools which you can use um, to remove some quality breaches. I talked a bit already, already about at every uh, step now. Again, cutting and trimming sequences is possible for so this end trimming, adapter trimming, um, you probably have to do. Okay, so I hope you now know how to run the quality control in the practical uh, presentation, I will do the hands-on. So we go a bit yeah, deeper and doing it a bit um, hands-on in Galaxy, how to, to run this. Um, I hope you know which kind of quality parameters are important for an next generation sequencing data. So you know how to run maybe already fast to see and what kind of impact it has for your quality control. And with that, I thank you very much. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this presentation, which is part of the Galaxy Training Network. So you find these slides, of course, there. And if you want to also join all the practical part, then we see and hear each other soonish. Bye bye.